I've been working with the uh, RTV, RTView for OptiView um, uh, OCT for quite some time. Uh, we initially employed it as part of our uh, Cornell College and Crosslinking studies. Uh, we noticed how accurate it was in measuring epithelial thickness. So we employed it to understand some of the nuances of Cornell College and Crosslinking, the uh, <clears throat> relationship of the uh, corneal contour in keratoconus eyes, how it gets that way, why the cornea steepens shortly after cross-linking and whatnot. <clears throat> so it was really a, 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 an addition to our armamentarium. Uh, another use that we found for it was uh, the location of corneal flaps in uh, post-refractive eyes, ones uh, that were referred to us where we didn't know the uh, exact flap thickness. We were able to identify the flap interface in many of these with a resolution that was uh, unavailable in uh, other devices. So that was my introduction to it. <clears throat> More recently, um, we have uh, started to use it as a method for determining to total corneal power, which is uh, in part the subject matter for our discussion today. And so most of you know that the cornea has two refractive surfaces, the anterior surface and the posterior, posterior surface. Traditionally, and back in the old days, we used keratometers to measure the corneal power. In doing so, the keratometer made a couple of uh, assumptions. One is that uh, the corneal power was consistent across the surface so that if you measured the corneal power with a diameter of about three millimeters, you, that could be generalized to the um, entire cornea. That measures the anterior corneal power. We have to make assumptions about the posterior corneal power, and we have to make assumptions about the distribution of the curvature. Then we learned about topography so that we could look at the front surface generally and learn more about it. But the missing, um, the missing part of the puzzle there is the posterior corneal power. The posterior corneal power is measurable by the, uh, uh, by the OCT. As we move to an area of refractive cataract surgery, this is becoming much more important because our patients are demanding much more accuracy in what we do. In the world of toric lenses, we need to be able to determine not only what the uh, anterior corneal toricity is like, but the posterior corneal toricity. So there are many applications in today's um, <clears throat> more precise environment than there have ever been in the past. Corneal refractive surgery is one of the uh, areas where, this, uh, where, where the OCT is especially applicable. In corneal refractive surgery, we alter the anterior curvature of the cornea. So that makes assumptions that have traditionally been made about the relationship between the anterior corneal power and the posterior corneal power uh, incorrect. And this is the reason we have difficulties in, uh, in determining the proper uh, intraocular lens power for these eyes. So to summarize what I've said, uh, this illustration here talks about measurement of the anterior corneal power here with the uh, Myers of a traditional keratometer with a green light in the, <clears throat> in the world of topography with extrapolation of the posterior surface. So if we take a patient who has had myopic LASIK, the anterior surface is going to be flatter than what it was preoperatively but the posterior surface will be largely unchanged. And therefore, we have difficulties in determining the corneal power for intraocular lens power calculations in these patients. So this is a good place to start to utilize the capabilities of the OptiView to solve our problems. Let's take a look at the accuracy of measurement in comparison with other uh, instruments. Here's ultrasound up here, Schamflug up here, and an OCT here, which has about three times the resolution of the Pentacam. Here we see a LASIK flap in a Pentacam, and here's the same patient with an OptiView. And as you can see here, we can see Bowman's layer, we can see the thickness of the epithelium, and we can see the flap interface which is not possible for Schamflug devices. 
The corneal power can be measured reproducibly with the OCT. These are normal eyes showing the <clears throat> mean standard error and the pool standard deviation. So you can see it's accurate to within about 0.2 diopters. It also has excellent reproducibility in post-LASIK eyes with a standard deviation that's about the same. So it is reproducible and also more robust because it can measure both the anterior and the posterior corneal powers. It can also measure corneal powers across the cornea in corneas that have a regular astigmatism for whatever, e whatever reason. So here's the pachymetry report, and here is the anterior and posterior corneal power within the central three millimeters. This paper, uh, paper by Tang is a very good uh, uh, <clears throat> illustration of the capabilities of the system. It looks at the prediction of IOL power using an IOL master and all of the formulas that were associated with the IOL master, selecting the best of those, which was the Hagus, comparing it with the IOL master after myopic laser vision correction the mean absolute error was significantly lower for the OCT than it was for the IOL master. These are the numbers after hyperopic laser vision correction. The mean absolute error here is also lower. And as most of you are aware, there are a number of methods for correct for calculating IOL powers after refractive surgery. Clinical history, contact lens over refraction, IOL master, orb scan. And here those are on that same population of eyes with a mean absolute error ranging all the way up to 1.78 from the clinical history. And here is the OCT. So that compares much more favorably than the other methods of correcting, of determining IOL powers. So I set upon using this in my own clinic when it first became available. <clears throat> and these are my initial experience with uh, five eyes. These are patients with post-refractive, post-corneal refractive surgery undergoing cataract surgery. We weren't quite as good on this group as we are as we were with the numbers that I just showed you. There were some challenging cases here, and uh, there were some um, long eyes and uh, <clears throat> also some reasonably short eyes. When I correct, uh, calculate the IOL power for these uh, eyes, I use 18 different formulas, including contact lens over over refraction, clinical history, the holiday. Um, uh, Pentacam measurements. So <clears throat> when we began to do this years ago and published a couple of papers on it, we began a spreadsheet and simply added to it as the literature became available. So it now takes about 30 minutes for us to calculate an IOL power for a post-refractive case, including collection of all the data, analysis of all the data, entry of all the, all the data. And so here are the comparisons, the mean absolute error with our methodology of doing it at 0.98, and here it is with our initial five cases with the, uh, uh, with the OCT, 0.91. This represents about 30 minutes of work for each patient. This represents about two minutes of work for each patient. So I look forward to collecting more data to verify the advantages, but I can tell you one huge advantage right at the start and that is it's a whole lot faster, and it appears to be much more accurate as well. So confirming the uh, findings reported in the uh, Wang paper, it looks like this is going to be a welcome uh, addition to our armamentarium for taking care of these difficult patients in the future.